Good morning. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with loss, anxiety, and codependency. My name is Jerry. Thank you. Some of you got it. <laughs> uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, I embarked on a journey and a ministry that I wasn't sure where it would take me. The journey's had some rough roads, detours, yet a, le- a year later I'm more vested, involved, and my belief in this ministry is beyond anything I could have imagined looking back. And looking ahead in this new year, or this year, as I have the opportunity to share and Uh, In Matt's absence, I'll be focusing my efforts to inform, encourage, involve, and hopefully remove the stigmatism that often surrounds this ministry called Celebrate Recovery. I like you. (laughs) I want to start this morning with a promise straight from God's Word. Isaiah, the prophet, says in Isaiah 57, verses 18 and 19, and this is on the screen in front of you, I have seen how they acted, but I will heal them. I will lead them and help them, and I will comfort those who mourn. I offer peace to all, both near and far. I will heal my people. If you would, I want you to imagine yourself just for a minute that you're standing in a prison cell. And let's say it's an eight by eight cell and there are three walls and there's a door in front. And you're standing in the middle of that cell and your hands and feet are not only in chains but they're shackled. Jesus stands on the outside of that door and he offers you keys to freedom, peace, and happiness. Would you accept those keys that are offered to you? Galatians 5 says, Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Verse 13 again says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through faith, through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. In essence, by accepting and taking the keys, you are trusting His promises to find hope for a better future, a life of freedom, peace, and happiness. In essence, what God says through the prophet Isaiah, if you are hurt, I will heal you. If you're confused... I will lead you. If you feel helpless, I will help you. If you feel alone, I will comfort you. If you feel anxious and afraid, I will offer you peace. You see, since the beginning of time, men and women have searched for happiness usually in the wrong places and in the wrong ways. But there is a place where one can go and find absolutely going to work principles that will lead to healing and happiness. These principles come from the most profound rabbi, the most profound teacher, the most profound person to ever walk this earth, and I'm not talking about Dr. Phil or Oprah. The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. His words. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus laid out principles for freedom and happiness in what we have referred to his greatest message, arguably his greatest message, the Sermon on the Mount. And the first verses are referred to as the Beatitudes. Matt has spoken on that a number of times. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed, and remember you can exchange the word happy for blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for they So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this ministry that we're referring to, the principle, Celebrate Recovery's principles and foundation, is built on Jesus' words. Not man's, not man's steps, but Jesus' works to what leads to freedom, peace, and happiness. They created an acrostic. We do a lot of acrostics in Celebrate Recovery, easier to hang uh, memories on and understanding. So here's the acrostic. It spells recovery, these eight principles. R stands for realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to change my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. The E stands for earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and he has the power to help me to recover. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. The O stands for openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and someone I trust. V stands for voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. E stands for evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me and make amends for harms I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. The R stands for reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and gain the power to follow his will. And the Y says, yield myself to God to be used to bring good news to others both by my example and by my words here's a truth everybody needs recovery everybody needs recovery everyone is broken in some way Bible calls it sin. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I like the way I heard recently on a, on a uh, podcast by Pastor Rick, where he said there, there are really two types of people, only really two types of people, those who know they need recovery and those who don't yet know they need recovery. Remainder of our time, we're going to focus and look at principles one and two. Let me ask you a couple questions. Do you ever stay up late at night when you know you need to sleep? Do you ever eat or drink more than you should? Not me, that's not my... Do you ever know the right thing to do, but don't do it? Have you ever tried to control somebody or something and found them or it uncontrollable? Welcome to the human race. 
You see, it's our human nature. The, t- the Bible tells us that this sin nature gets us into all kinds of trouble. We choose to do things that aren't good for us, even when we know better. You see, we all have a tendency, a propensity to do wrong, and we will wrestle with it as long as we have breath. Amen? Even after coming to Christ, we still have the desires that pull us in the wrong direction. The Apostle Paul understood this. In Romans 7, the Living Bible says it this way, I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well what I'm doing is wrong, but I can't help myself because it is sin inside me that makes me do these things. Why do we continue to make poor choices? Why do we repeat the same mistakes over and over? That definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And here's the reason. We want to be in control. We want to be in control. We want to decide what's right and wrong for us. We want to decide what I will do and not do. I don't want anybody telling me what I can and can't do. And the moment that somebody tells me I can't, I want right? We want to be God. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. It's nothing new. Let's go back to Genesis. I'm not going to 315, okay? <laughs> you know the story. God finishes creation And each day, at the end of the day, morning and night, he says, it's good. And then he takes dust of the ground and forms it and breathes breath into its nostrils and creates man in his image after his likeness. And he looked at it and he said, it is very good. The Lord planted a garden and placed Adam in that garden. He gives them the responsibility of taking care of that garden. God gave some structure and one set of instructions. He could eat of any tree, but the one that was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat or you will die. God creates man's counterpart, Eve puts them in paradise, and they start to control paradise along with the serpent. You see, when they're told not to eat of that tree that's in the center, where do you think they went? Straight to it. The serpent doesn't ask Adam, but talks to Eve. She knows exactly what God's boundary was, And it says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden you may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent challenges Eve. You surely will not die. For God knows that in that day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we all know what happens next. And this is the problem. This has been our problem from that act until the present. We want to be God. Now, we don't like saying that. We're not comfortable with that. We say, no, I don't don't want to be God. That's too big a responsibility. But we play God all the time. First of all, by denying our humanity and trying to control everything for our own purpose, our own selfish reasons. We want to be in charge. I won't attempt to sing the song, but you know it. I did it. We love that. 
We love the self-made man. I did it my way. I want to be in control. I want to decide what's right and wrong. I want to be God. Here's some ways that we do that. We try to control our image. We play God by controlling our image. We care so much about what other people think of us. We don't want them to know who we really are. We spend billions on makeup, on hair products, on this and that, trying to control our image. I have a ton spent in shaving products. Who cares? We try to control our image. I, I remember starting a small group, community group in my home years and years ago with some friends. In our first meeting, we went around the circle talking about some of our expectations, some of our fears, and I remember a friend that I was in a music program uh, together, and uh, one of the things she said, one of the things that I fear is that if you know me, you won't like me. So we play games. We wear masks. We pretend. We fake it. We deny our weaknesses, we deny our feelings. I'm tempted, I won't ask how many had arguments on the way to church this morning. (laughs) There we go, thank you. (laughs) And when we do, we walk into church and we put a smile on. How are you? Great! (laughs) Could be better. (laughs) Under the breath, exactly. I remember, I've, I've had this in the 21 years here many times where a, a situation, a husband, a wife, or a couple talking about some of their struggles, and where, where's your small group in this? Where, where, I would never tell my group this. It's too personal. What would they think? We try to control other people. Parents try to control kids. Kids try to control parents. At least mine did. Wives try to control husbands. Husbands try to control wives. Others use anger, fear, or intimidation. Or my all-time favorite, the silent treatment. (laughs) We try to control our problems. When we try to control our problems, we say, I'm okay. I, I don't need any help. I certainly don't need counseling or recovery. I, I can quit any time. I'll work it out on my own. I've got this. God's got my back. We're, we're cool. We're good. We try to control our pain. We do that by eating, or some by not eating. We control pain by getting drunk, by smoking, by taking drugs, or abusing uh, prescription meds. Some of us do it through sports or being in and out of relationships. We control our pain by becoming angry, abusive, critical, And for my Baptist friends, judgmental. I grew up Baptist, okay? But real pain comes when we realize no matter how hard we try, we're not in control. Finally. Principle says, one says, realize I'm, I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. It was with my group. We were talking about things that we felt like we had control of. 
So we made a list of things that we thought we could control. And as we started sharing all this, we were, oh, I got control. Oh, no, I really don't. Oh, I, I got one. I can control. No, not so much. And we came to the conclusion, reality is there is very little that I'm in control of. Realize I'm not God. I admit I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Friends, that's the first step in any healing. The Beatitude says, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Admitting your need or weakness is what being spiritually poor is all about. Matt's talked about that a number of times. The Bible says that admitting my weakness, I actually find strength. The first choice to healing our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and we use that term a lot, and there's a paper out in the lobby where Cindy will be that has some definitions so you know what we're talking about there. But the first choice in healing those things is acknowledging that we're not God. First of all, we acknowledge that I'm, I'm powerless to change the past. Anybody here have the ability to change the past? I'd like to meet you. <laughs> got a few things I'd like to, maybe a little back to the future or something. I admit that I'm powerless to control people. I admit I'm powerless to cope with my harmful habits and behaviors. You see, that leads to a humble heart. When we acknowledge that we're powerless, When we acknowledge that I am out of control of my out of control life, that leads to humility. God's word says that he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God's grace has the power to heal us. You see, our pride makes us believe that we can go it alone, that we can figure it out, that we can deal with it, we can get over it, but we can't. Because if you could, you would have already done it by now. God's path to healing is very different than my path to healing. God's path to healing is different than our path to healing. It runs counter to everything that I feel in my self. Look at Jesus' words in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. On my car and yours, there are a series of lights. Put the key in or you turn, push the button. I don't have one of those push-button things yet. I, well, I know you do. <laughs> and you start the engine, all these lights flash. Tells you that everything's working, right? But as you're driving, there's one light that when it comes on, sparks fear. <laughs> check engine. That check engine light doesn't necessarily tell you what's wrong. It just tells you something's wrong somewhere and that you need to get it looked at and figured out. It means something is wrong somewhere. Do you know what God's check engine light for us is? Pain. Pain. Pain is God's way of telling us that there's a problem. C.S. Lewis said it so well. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. Pain is God's way of letting us know something is seriously wrong and needs attention. Pain is God's check engine light. And just so that we don't develop an incorrect theology of pain and suffering, just because God allows pain in our lives does not mean that he causes that pain. 
And it certainly doesn't mean that he enjoys seeing you in pain. Pain is often the consequence of poor choices. Sometimes they're the consequence of our own choices and the messes that we make. And sometimes they're the choices and consequences of others. But God allows the natural consequences of these poor choices to play out. Don't ignore the pain. Recognize it as God's way of saying something's wrong here. Principle one says, I admit it, I'm helpless. I'm powerless. Principle two says, there is a power greater than me, and there is hope. Principle two says, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Again, verse four says, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Somebody after last night's service said, I, I've never quite got that verse. I thought, it, you know, when somebody died or your friends were in trouble, that you felt bad for them. That's what mourning was. That's not the context of the mourning here. And it's an important part of the gospel message. To mourn is to be sad, to grieve, to regret. God's pathway is through mourning. It's mourning the things that I have done that were wrong. It is mourning the people that I have hurt. It is mourning for the wrong that's in the world. It is mourning for the messes that we have around us. And acknowledging I don't have the power to fix it or change it, but I know one who does have the power. And there is hope. God's path is through mourning. It's different than our path. My path for mourning is quite something. I want a quick, when I'm hurting, I want a quick fix. I want to do something that's instantaneous that's going to help my pain go away. And for some in this room, for some, it's turning to, to alcohol. I don't feel comfortable with life, so I'll take a couple drinks at night after work. It'll get past the worries, and it'll just get me through tomorrow. I'll deal with it tomorrow. Some of us turn to gambling. I don't feel comfortable. I'm stressed, so I'll run out to Diamond Gyms or to Vegas or State Line or maybe online. And I'll get that thrill. I'll get that instant feeling of excitement, adrenaline. Or I just gamble the time away. Some of us turn to shopping. That's true for me. I talked to my step study about this area of my life, and I said then I started in college. I actually think it started before that. See, I grew up as a preacher's kid. Baptist, that's where I make fun of them. <laughs> and we were dirt poor. Dad, for the most of the years, had uh, part-time churches and was a social worker, worked for the uh, Fresno County, Hanford County, Tulare County, uh, different counties as a social worker and then as a supervisor. He had maintained two jobs. We lived for many years in the San Joaquin Valley there, and I wore a lot of hand-me-downs. I didn't have an older brother. They were hand-me-downs from people in the church. Oh, you're wearing my, my pants. I hated that. And often mom would roll them up because they'd be too long so that I could grow into them. And every time I wore them, I was reminded that I was poor. People would leave groceries on the front, front porch. We always had food to eat. I developed inside of me a sense of fear. 
that I would somehow run out. So I started to hoard. And I started to buy. Impulsive spending. Because if I could buy something, it made me feel better. It would take that sense of poorness away. Because look, I bought a suit. I bought a new shirt. Recent years, I bought more technology. (laughs) In those days, I'd put something on a charge card. Or we'd put it on layaway. The looking and deciding what I needed and purchasing those items were a comfort to me until I got home or until I finished wearing that one time and now it wasn't new. Nobody's going to say, oh, new clothes. Or I get home and realize that now I'm further in debt and I go buy something else. And it became and still is a propensity for me to go into that cycle wanting something at Best Buy or Amazon to make me feel good. And maybe you're different. Yeah, golf clubs, exactly. (laughs) Thanks, Jeff. (laughs) And it always promises, but it under-delivers, doesn't it? And it is golf clubs. It's it's that one new putter. It's going to make me a scratch golfer and I put the same way with it (laughs) but I looked at that because it's a quick fix it's a quick way to comfort some of us turn to sex to alleviate the anxieties of the day we turn to pornography unhealthy relationships affairs can be can be that rush that temporary feeling of comfort some turn to entertainment It's not about the occasional movie. It's about losing yourself in TV. It's just a way of pushing back distractions like frustrations, unresolved projects, or strained relationships of the day. And you can just easily get lost in another world. And some turn to self-pity. It can look like this. Get home, close the curtains, get into a darkened space, which usually involves chocolate or ice cream, your own little personal pity party. For a short time, it gives a sense of comfort. Anger. Sometimes anger is used to make someone else hurt more than we do. We'll make someone else hurt or feel bad so that it minimizes my feelings. Some turn to food. As it's been said, some don't eat to live, they live to eat. And i got to tell you, in the five years after my separation divorce, that has become an issue for me. Work. It's achieving something so that you feel better about yourself. So you work and you work and you try to get to the place of comfort and hope. But God's idea of hope and comfort is not those ideas. God's idea of comfort is through mourning, through sadness, through regret, through grief over the kind of life that I've lived, which is God's pathway to comfort and hope. You see, Jesus turns things upside down. It runs counter to what I want. I don't want to admit that I have a problem to myself, and I certainly don't feel real great right now about admitting my issues to you. I don't want to get to a place where I realize that I have to give it over to God and stop trying to be in control. I'd much prefer to do it myself. I'll figure it out. But isn't that what being a believer is all about, being a Christian? Coming to a place where we have to turn it over to Jesus? Because if we don't, we're just spinning our wheels, just trying to get that Next quick and easy fix of comfort and hope. God blesses those who mourn. That's God's path. And I'm amazed in myself and I'm amazed at us that we will trust God with our ultimate destiny, but we have a difficult time putting our trust and faith in Him today. 
If we're going to experience the healing of God, if we're going to experience his power, then we have to know and come to understanding who he is. Romans 8, 34 says, Who then is he who condemns you? No one. No one. Christ Jesus died. More than that, he was raised from the dead is at the right hand of God and is also interceding on our behalf. God wants us to know that he does not condemn us. He loves us no matter the mess that we have created in our lives. Amen? He loves us. Here are some truths about God that we need to know. First of all, God exists. The Bible makes it clear that belief in God is essential. He says, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Second truth about God, you matter to him. Since most people believe God exists, the real issue is what kind of God is he? And do I really matter? God knows your situation. God knows your hurts, your hang-ups, and your habits. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows what you're going through, and he cares. King David said it this way, You have listened to my troubles and have seen the crisis of my soul. God knows what you and I need before we ask. Scripture said the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Another thing about God is that he he doesn't just know of your situation. He cares about your situation. The Bible says as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And here's an absolute truth. God's love is not based on performance. It is based on his character. Please understand that. You can't do enough. You can't be good enough for long enough to warrant his love. It is based on his character, not on your goodness. Another thing we need to know, God has the power to change your situation. Sometimes God changes you. Sometimes he changes your situation. Sometimes he changes both. But he has the power. Paul prayed for our understanding of his mighty power. He prayed, I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of his power for those, for us who believe in him. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Amen and amen. And if God can raise Jesus from the dead, he can certainly raise a dead relationship. He can set us free from an addiction. He can take away our guilt and shame. He can help us close the door on the past so that those memories stop haunting us. God has the power to change us in our situation. So in closing, When we access God's power, he supplies us with what we need. Not always what we want, but what we need. Scripture says the Spirit of God has given us and fills us with power, love, and self-control. How do we plug into his power? It's pretty simple. Believe and receive. Believe that God exists. Believe that you matter to him. Believe that he has the power to help, to change you. And you can know him right now. I know a lot of you. I know a lot of your faces. I know a lot of your stories. I don't know all of you. And I don't know exactly why you walk through the door, but Jesus does. God knows. And if you've never had that moment where you invited him to come into your life, the 
All you have to do is believe and receive. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. For God never puts anyone to shame. He never disappoints. You can today have that relationship and plug into that power that will change. Let's pray. Mighty God, thank you that you didn't just create us to walk through life and bump into things and make a mess and then we die. Sometimes we don't understand the mess of the world and we don't understand the complexity and the brokenness But in your wisdom, you knew that you created us to love you. But it's not love unless there is a choice to love or not to love. You gave man in the garden and Eve in the garden the choice to love, to worship you, but they weren't puppets. You gave us a choice, and we make choices every day. Help us this morning to realize that we're not God and we're not in control. There's very little that we have any control of. And certainly don't have control of my out-of-control life. Happy are the poor in spirit. God, this morning we believe that you exist and you have the power to give us hope. Whatever we're struggling, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a job, whether it's children, whether it's parents, and for some in this room, it's both, children and parents, and just the challenge, the hurt, the pain. Help us to realize that you exist, you care for us, and that you give us the power. give us hope you give us peace and father I know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're standing outside the door the prisons that we have created for ourselves and you hold the keys to peace happiness and freedom may we accept your gift your offer of those keys in our life in Jesus name amen